When we talk about Churchill, it is important, that I believe, to keep in mind that he starts in his military service in India from 1896 to 98. He is then in the Sudan uh, as uh, Britain is expanding its control in Africa. Then he's back in India briefly. Then he leaves the army for a while. He's a journalist. He's a combatant in the Boer War. And he is captured and escapes in the fighting in South Africa. Please remember, this is a imperialist war over Britain's possession of as much of the continent of Africa as possible. He is then gets himself elected successfully to Parliament. In World War I, he is some of the time actually in the military on the Western Front. It is, I think, safe to say that he thinks from the beginning of his career to the end of India as the essential and most important part and the key to the empire. He is in Parliament, and he sees that there's the Depression. World Depression affects England very heavily. And that there are now three threats to the British Empire developing. Italy, as it turns away to Mussolini in the Mediterranean. Japan, as you know, it starts war with, has a war with China in the early 30s and then starts a bigger one in 37. And then there are the Germans at home, and who knows, threatening Britain at home, what's going on there. He does not get into high government posts because he follows in domestic affairs uh, lines which are not satisfactory. He befriends the temporary ruler, Edward VIII, who is obliged, as you may know, uh, to abdicate because his American wife has been divorced and may not even be fully divorced and whatnot. And that that's not quite the right thing for a king. Huh? But he, that is Churchill, uh, likes Edward VIII. There is, if you will, this is a personal comment. It is ironic that later on, when Churchill holds Britain in World War II, Edward VIII, who is no longer king, would like to make peace with Germany. <laughs> and the way he keeps him from doing any of that is he ships him off to be governor of the Bahamas. That's about as far as Churchill can send his dear friend away. <laughs> the other thing that keeps him out of office, his opposition to the conservative parties uh, developing in collaboration with the Labour Party for Indian independence eventually, new rules for India. So he is out of office. But he does recognize that Hitler's 
first his rise to power, then his development of German rearmament and policies, that this is a new threat to Britain. And so when the government, this is Neville Chamberlain as prime minister, declares war when the Germans invade Poland, these earlier objections uh, to his being in the government, Chamberlain overrules and brings him into the government as First Lord of the Admiralty, a position he had held for a while in the First World War. Then, as the Germans and Brits fight over Norway in April and May of 1940, there is the ironic development that the loser wins. Churchill is in charge of the Admiralty and has been pushing occupation of Norway to halt in the winter Germany's steel imports from Sweden. In the summer, they come from Sweden through the Baltic uh, to Germany, but in the winter, the Baltic is frozen and the Steel is shipped to Narvik in Norway and then by ship to Germany. And while the British Navy does reasonably well in the Norwegian campaign, in the end the Germans win. But when they do, Chamberlain falls and ironically the loser wins. Churchill becomes Prime Minister, May of 1940. As I'm sure you know, as the Germans strike in the West, having conquered Denmark and Norway, as they strike in the West at the very same time as Churchill becomes Prime Minister of England, the Western Allies are crushed by the Germans. France, at least the official government of France, surrenders to the Germans and in early June signs an armistice. But Britain doesn't. And if you look at this for a moment from the German point of view, if you're at war with Britain and France and you've crushed France, obviously now it's Britain's turn. And they plan and prepare for an invasion of Britain. The Churchill government rallies the British people. The Germans lose the decisive battle of the Second World War. It's usually referred to as the Battle of Britain. Churchill's predecessor as Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, has gotten Britain's fighter forces built up and the electronic control of that fighter force set up so that the Germans can't make it. They lose in the air, and they also lose in another way that isn't 
mentioned in quite the same context, but in my opinion at least belongs into the same context. And that is the effort to destroy British morale by bombing London and other cities. This is not a pleasant experience for the Brits. I mean, I was in London at the time, and it's no great fun spending your time in the air raid shelter, or as I did, wandering around and looking at, in the little parks in London, the crews that controlled the barrage balloons that forced the Germans to be up high. But the notion that this would destroy the British public's support of a continued war effort against Germany turned out to be a complete miscalculation of the Germans. They, in other words, not only lose the technical military part of the Battle of Britain, but they lose what they had hoped to attain the, as a political advantage from what is frequently referred to as the blitz, the lightning, the uh, bombing. What had bothered Churchill for obvious reasons was that Italy, Mussolini takes Italy into the war on Germany's side in June of 1940 when it is obvious to him that France has been crushed. And what that means is a practical sense from Churchill's point of view that parts of the British Empire are endangered. To begin with, Mussolini wins the only victory that Italy wins in World War II. They manage to conquer a tiny piece here. Somalia, this area, had been divided. The Italians got the majority of it. The Brits got a little piece, and the French got a tiny piece of Somalia. So the next time you look at a careful map of Africa in the 19th, early 20th century, you can see that. The Italians, from their forces in Somalia, proceed to crush and occupy British Somalia. But then, from Libya and Somalia, they proceed to attack Egypt. And that is of critical importance for the Brits, not because Churchill is a great admirer of the pyramids, but because of the Suez Canal. That's the way you get from the Mediterranean to go to India. That's a little shorter than doing it this way. The world map, I think, shows that very dramatically. The British have then forces and eventually conquer the Italian Somaliland and try next to conquer Libya, which is the big Italian colony adjacent to Egypt on the Mediterranean, which they had acquired the Italians earlier in the century from the Ottoman Empire. When they 
British advance, Hitler becomes worried about his Italian friend. He is worried that if the Italians lose Libya, Mussolini will be dumped by the Italians. Italy is supposed to increase its colonial empire and not lose it. That was undoubtedly a correct assessment on Hitler's part. And to make sure that this doesn't happen to Mussolini, Hitler sends an able German general who had shown his ability in the crushing of France earlier in the war that I mentioned, a man by the name of Rommel. You may have heard of Erwin Rommel and a batch of German troops sends them across Italy and the Mediterranean to Libya to fight the Brits there and make sure that the British do not conquer the Italian colony of Libya. It's not what he would like to do, Hitler, but he doesn't want Mussolini tossed. So uh, the uh, Brits, although they have at one point uh, diverted some forces to Greece when the Italians had attacked Greece, but there the Germans in the spring of 41 bailed them out as well as, as I said, sending troops to North Africa. And as they push the Brits back, they eventually halt them at Alamein. As I'm, we have gone through this earlier today, the Germans when they've gotten things in the Balkans straightened out, then troops sent to protect Libya invade the Soviet Union in the summer of 41. And from Churchill's point of view, not that he loves the Russians or thinks that Stalin is his best friend, but it's great for the Germans to concentrate there as opposed to the possibility of their trying to invade England or expanding their forces in North Africa or uh, immediately moving uh, into south, from Southeast Europe into the Middle East. It's nice of Adolf to attack the Soviet Union, and it is under these circumstances that Churchill does what he can to help the Soviets. As I have already mentioned, the Brits and Russians jointly occupy Iran so that while some of the aid is going up here, as I've already mentioned, some of it goes up the Persian Gulf here and to Iran, across Iran, trains, and then the Soviets can take it by train wherever <laughs> they think it should be. Uh, and as I have mentioned, the series of convoys goes from Britain up around here to Murmansk, the port that the Germans 
were not able to take. They tried several times. The Finns had come in into the war against the Soviet Union on the German side to reconquer what they'd had to give the Russians at the end of their prior war, uh, and maybe a bit more. But the combined German Finnish forces fighting toward, to get toward Murmansk, ironically, I think as a historian, get stopped at Zapadnaya Ruta, which is where the Germans had had that naval base <laughs> that uh, Stalin had provided his dear friend that I mentioned yeah, in my prior lecture, so that Murmansk and f even further Archangel remain important ports on the Arctic Ocean under Soviet control during the whole war. Okay, that the Germans try and the, F and the Finns try, but they never get it. In August of 1941, Churchill meets Roosevelt in Newfoundland, in their famous conference, and they discuss a whole variety of issues. I will discuss this from the American side in my lecture later on when we talk about Roosevelt. But what I think is important is that already before they meet personally in August of 41, they have been corresponding, quite frankly. And now they meet personally and become, if not friends, very accommodating uh, individuals. I will go into this also when uh, discussing Roosevelt. But as I am sure you know, in December of 41, the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor and bring the United States into the war. Churchill immediately comes to Washington. And there is a series of conferences between him, his military advisors, and Roosevelt, and Roosevelt's military advisors. And what is important, most important, I think it's safe to say, to Churchill, is for Roosevelt to maintain a position that he had earlier when this was theoretical has always held. Europe has to be ahead of East Asia. And if Japan goes to war on Germany's side, Europe and Germany must still be the priority for Britain and the United States. And it should not be difficult for you to understand that after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor and then attack on an invasion of the Philippines, which are still an American possession, then under those circumstances, Churchill would be worried that the United States will concentrate on beating the Japanese, although the Germans have declared war on them. And when Churchill, as I said, is in Washington with his advisors, it becomes clear to him 
that Roosevelt and his military advisors have not changed their view. The American public may be paying attention to what's going on in the Philippines, and then when the Japanese invade a couple of islands you know, off Alaska, and all the fighting, I mean, I'll have some things to say about that shortly, but the president, who is the commander-in-chief uh, of armed forces, according to the United States Constitution, and the top military all agree with Churchill that Germany, Europe, must be the priority. And there is a combined military committee then in Washington, and Churchill appoints to it as the key British representative, the former head of the British Armed Forces, Field Marshal Sir John Dill. And Dill turns out to be very good at this, gets along marvelously with the Americans. In fact, he gets along so well with them that when later in the war, near the, I think it's late 44, he dies, he is buried in Arlington National Cemetery, something which does not happen normally to British field marshals. And since they get to have a horse, the next time you go to Arlington, you will have no difficulty finding Dill's grave. He's on a horse. It's one of these unusual things that the Americans do to honor him. Now, the Americans are planning and hoping and pushing for some invasions for the European plan. But with British insistence, instead we head for North Africa. The only thing that can be done with the cooperation of the British for an invasion is what is at one point called gymnast, but then eventually torch. That is to say, an invasion. Let me see just a minute. An invasion, not in Normandy, but on the African coast. Vichy French territory to cl clear the Mediterranean where Italy, which owns Sardinia and Sicily, which is in occupation of much of East of, of uh, Greece, had in April of 39 occupied Albania and is at least in control of substantial portions of Yugoslavia. Keep in mind now that from the British point of view, this is the important thing here, okay? the Suez Canal, and they've been holding at Alamein and so what you have starting in November, October, November of 1942, a British 
advance westward and a British in America, British landing here, American landing there, to clear the axis out of North Africa and uh, Churchill uh, goes to Moscow, in fact, he goes a couple of times to explain to Stalin that the second front isn't going to be where he thinks it should be. It's going to start down here. And Churchill periodically talks about the soft entrance into Europe is from the south. He denies the reality that the Alps protect Germany from the south. But it is reasonable to say that the Allied operation in North Africa does provide important aid to Stalin and the Soviet Union, although he will never admit it. When the Americans and Brits land in North Africa and fight here, the Germans do two things. They occupy the part of France that they had not occupied under the armistice signed back in 1940, okay? So now all of France is occupied. And they move substantial troops from here down, they get a long railway yard, and then they move them from Sicily to Tunisia. And the substantial German forces in Tunisia are not fighting Russian soldiers. They are obviously not on the Eastern Front. Hmm? And they fight, and the Italian forces that have been in Libya are being pushed back by definition, they end up in Tunisia, okay? So British and American forces are fighting the Germans and the Italians in Tunisia until early May of 1943. And by definition, when the Axis forces surrender, several hundred thousand of them, none of those German soldiers in, in, in that will ever fight on the Eastern Front. <laughs> they are in POW camps. Hmm? And what uh, goes on then is that after May 43, when the Axis forces surrender in Tunisia, I think that map might give you an idea, if you haven't read about it, where the Brits and Americans go next. Sicily is a little more convenient <laughs> than Normandy. Hmm? So with Churchill still emphasizing steadily against the Americans, the south of Europe, in July of 43, the Allies land in Sicily and fight and eventually push the German 
and Italian forces up, and in the process, Mussolini falls, but General Badoglio becomes the head of the active government in Italy. And in the fall, in September, Italy surrenders. But the forces that the Americans and Brits fight, first in Sicily, and then when they land here, just not far from Naples at Salerno, these are German forces. Whatever uh, one wants to say about this, the reality is that the Western Allies are fighting the Germans on land. And the German forces that they are fighting on land in Tunisia, in Sicily, and now in Italy are by definition not fighting the Russians on the Eastern Front, right? The pushing so hard in the Mediterranean also produces in the fall of at Churchill's insistence landings on the Italian islands, the Doricanese in the Aegean. But the Germans there beat them. It is the last German victory of the Second World War. The of getting into the rest of Europe from the southeast failed. September of 43, as I said, is the last German victory of the war when they retake a couple of the islands that the British forces have landed on and taken. At the end of November of 43, Churchill and Roosevelt and Stalin meet in Tehran, which on this map would be around here, because Stalin will not, would not meet them earlier, will not meet them anywhere either they've got to come to the Soviet Union or a place close to it. At Tehran, uh, Churchill is still arguing, and I'll come back to this too, with Roosevelt and Stalin about the what the Soviets call the real second front, the crossing of the English Channel. But uh, I think to some extent he's pushed aside by Roosevelt and Stalin. Churchill's very much concerned, as is Roosevelt, to get the Soviet Union into the war with Japan. Soviet Union is not engaged in war with Japan. And he promises that three months after the war in Europe is over, Soviet forces fighting in Europe will be moved and will fight against Japan. The political issue 
which most divides and leads to argument between the big three at Tehran and before and after is the Polish issue. The insistence of the Soviet Union, Stalin, of retaking the eastern part of Poland. And that is when, as I think I already mentioned once, Churchill suggests we'll just move Germany west. The Poles, if they have to give this up, will acquire this part of Germany and this part. And as I think I also mentioned, because of Roosevelt's insistence on the in independence of the Baltic states, Stalin insists that the northern part of East Prussia go to the Soviet Union. And you see, it is a nice way of, from his point of view, of making sure <laughs> that the Baltic states will be in the Soviet Union when it's all over. If you look at a map today of the world, you will see that the Baltic states are independent again, but on the other side, northern half of East Prussia is today a part of the Russian Federation. And its most important city, Königsberg, has been renamed. It's called Kaliningrad. It is named for the nominal president of the Soviet Union in World War II. Now, the push from uh, Churchill remains on the Italian campaign. And one has to recognize that whatever the advantages and disadvantages, that helps the Russians some. The insistence on an Landing in Western Europe is reinforced at the Tehran conference. It's true that new advances here lead to a postponement for some weeks of the planned landing in southern France to go along, squeeze the Germans when the uh, allies cross the channel. You can see that. But that operation, though postponed, does take place. As I do not have to tell you, the uh, Western allies land in Normandy. The commander, please note, and I'll come back to this, is an American. Eisenhower. And that operation means a British fighting in France and Belgium as it had in the First World War, but in terms of numbers and just generally, this is nothing like the British commitment to the Western Front in the First World War. There is substantial fighting, and the Brits take a part. Ironically, before that fighting, there had been a big argument between the Brits and Americans, and that was over what was called the transportation plan, a plan 
by you to use American and British bombers to destroy the railway system and the road bridges in France to keep the Germans from moving troops and equipment back and forth and supplies forward. Churchill had opposed that, but the Americans had insisted that this go. The other thing that there was an argument over was that Churchill periodically wanted Operation Jupiter, which was a landing in Norway. And we know that Hitler was very concerned about that. The Americans absolutely say no. We've got troops fighting here in Italy. We're going to have a big push here. The notion of now also going into Norway, that just is not practical. The threat, however, means that the Germans have to be ready for an invasion of Norway. And when eventually the German surrender comes in May of 1945, as you probably know, there are slightly over a quarter of a million German soldiers in Norway waiting for the invasion, with Jupiter invasion, which never came. Now, I have to uh, say something about uh, Churchill and the Pacific War, so we'll get a... Well, Matt, Churchill uh, supports the Allies and expects a major operation in the Indian Ocean, but as a practical matter, can only do some serious fighting to reclaim Burma. And that is important for two reasons. The main one from the American point of view is that this is where supplies go to nationalist China fighting the Japanese, and therefore keeping lots of Japanese troops busy on the continent and not able to fight against the Americans on islands in the Pacific. The other aspect is, from the British point of view, Burma borders India. And when the Japanese at one point tried to use it for an invasion of India and with a minimal cooperative army of Indians under General Bowles, the fighting at Kohima uh, is bitter. The Japanese are defeated and eventually the uh, Burma campaign in 1943-44, drives the Japanese out. And then there is, I'm talking from the British point of view, of combining that with some other operation. Uh, Churchill is talking about landing on Sumatra and Java to reclaim Singapore, which had surrendered to the Japanese and when they moved into Malaya. As you can see from Churchill's point of view, India was most important. The Mediterranean, therefore, the route to India was of critical significance. 
what happens is that in May of 1945, as you know, Germany surrenders. Fighting at the northern portion of the Western Front had, with American help, managed to drive to the Baltic Sea so that the Soviet Red Army could not get into Denmark. But with that part of the war over, the Brits, who had not had an election since 1935, figure they need to have one. So that on the one hand, the leaders in Britain and the United States are pretty sure that the war with Japan will last at least into 46 and possibly into 47. The reality in Britain is that in the election of July 45, Churchill's party, the Conservatives, are defeated. And the man who had, the labor leader who had been his deputy prime minister since 1940, Clement Attlee, the leader of the Labor Party, becomes the British prime minister and is making, with his assistance, of course, is making the choices and decisions uh, that have to be made. Uh, Churchill is, you will easily understand, very unhappy to be defeated and not see over the rest of the war, and especially the defeat of Japan. Many years later, he gets to be prime minister again. But in 1945, in July, he is defeated so that the immediate post-war issues, both in Europe and in the Pacific, are no longer in his hands. When soon after the Allied leaders meet at Potsdam, a suburb of Berlin, it's not Churchill. It's Attlee uh, who meets with the, by this time, new American president, Harry Truman. And so the main thing for Churchill, at least for a few years, is to write his multi-volume history of the war, which you will undoubtedly find in most libraries. Thank you. Hey, we're going to open the floor again to questions and comments about the Churchill. Any comments? And also, we'll watch online for those who want to ask a question. I'll, I'll start here. Bill, we have a question. In the uh, first face-to-face -face meeting between Churchill um, and um, Roosevelt, was there any discussion? What was the discussion about the future of the British Empire? While Roosevelt was very strongly opposed to colonialism, as most Americans were, he was very careful. And he wasn't going to raise those issues with Churchill, knowing how devoted to the empire Churchill was. 
There are arguments, but not over colonies. So I just about Churchill's leadership during the Battle of Britain, which he had yeah. just become the leader. What were the qualities of Churchill that made him so effective in leading the British during that crisis in well, 1940? Churchill was a very effective orator. Keep in mind, he'd been in Parliament for, for decades. He had run for office, in other words. And there's no question that he was, at this point, responding, both responding to and creating a public sense which was already there. And therefore, what he, what he had to do was not persuade the British public to do something different or to change their minds about something, but rather to make them more enthusiastic and dedicated to a view they already held. And I think that that has to be seen as his uh, contribution to this. And, and not so much that he uh, changed any public opinion, but rather that he endorsed, enforced, enriched uh, in, uh, in, in a, a sense we got to fight them. We're not going to let those so-and-sos come over here and run this country. Uh, there was this clear sense that we wanted, we were going to remain independent. And uh, the French, with whom, after all, most of preceding centuries, the British had fought against France, they collapsed in no time at all. Well, that just tells you what the French are like. So, uh, but we're not going to give in to these guys. And the things that were done that sort of the ordinary person saw, that is that street signs are taken down. So if German parachutists can't find their way, uh, that there is strict rationing because there has, there has to be, uh, that uh, everything is blacked out. Those things uh, don't need, the, the Brits don't need persuading. What they need is encouragement. Mm -hmm. And that Churchill most certainly provides. So maybe a great leader is someone who articulates what the population already feels. Yeah. Uh, I have a couple of questions. I'm going to come here and then back. Could you comment briefly on Churchill's effect on American morale? Well, Churchill's effect on Americans was, on the whole, positive. Americans saw him as a good leader, uh, as a man who stood up against uh, the Germans and uh, after they attacked against the Japanese. And if he had some odd ideas, well, that's characteristic of Brits. Uh, he doesn't have those more than anybody else. So on the whole, public opinion in this country was positive towards him, I think it's safe to say. It's interesting, both the Americans and the British had this contradiction of maintaining empire or control over non-white people. At the very time they're arguing for freedom, Churchill is arguing for imperialism. So it, I, I think there's a tension there, right? Is that sort of, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, let me come back here. I think we have a question. Uh, you mentioned that um, Britain 
wanted to uh, invade, uh, have an invasion of Norway, and Germany was afraid of that. They left a lot of troops there. What's the military rationale for invading Norway at that time? I, I'm sorry, just a second. Let me get this up. I'll sit down. What is, what, what is the question? The question is, um, Churchill has advocated the invasion of Norway, and the question is, what would be the military rationale for invading Norway? The military is the same one why he had been interested in that in 1939-40, is to keep the German submarines uh, in the more difficult situation but most important was that German military industry depended on steel imports from Sweden. And while in the summer, those imports were shipped from a Swedish port, Lulea, to Germany across the Baltic, in the winter, that was frozen, and all the iron was on a train to Narvik, where it was put on ships, which then went along the Norwegian coast to into the North Sea and to Germany. And so, that looked to Churchill, as it had to others, uh, as a good way to hurt Germany. It was not that he wanted Norway made into a British colony or anything like that. This was a military matter. Furthermore, there was, from his point of view, one practical military aspect, and that was in helping the Soviet Union by sending convoys to Murmansk. That would be a lot easier if you did not have to worry about German forces in Norway, in Norwegian airports and uh, shipping ports that interfere with and sink So, from that point of view, Norway was very important potentially. And as I mentioned earlier, the Germans knew how important that was and had something like 260,000 soldiers up there just in case they were needed. Okay, I'll come over here. I guess if you were a German soldier, you'd rather be on the coast of Norway than in Stalingrad, right? I um, was Macmillan forced by pub uh, not Macmillan was Chamberlain forced by public opinion to bring Churchill into the cabinet? What what was her? Do you think was his? Re I know that he and uh, Churchill didn't get along before, and so what what was the root cause of his bringing Churchill in? other than losing the war. So the question is, Chamberlain and Churchill did not get along, but Chamberlain brought Churchill into the cabinet? Yes. What was his rationale for bringing Churchill into the cabinet despite his disagreements? Chamberlain's rationale for bringing Churchill in. He knew that uh, Churchill had been strongly in favor of resisting Germany and had criticized him for what Churchill thought were some concessions that had been made to Germany. <coughs> and so now that Britain was at war with Germany, Chamberlain thought it was important to bring him into the cabinet. And since he had been First Lord of the Admiralty in the First World War for a while, it looked to him like him.
in September of 39 when he made this. And Churchill had differed with his colleagues in the conservative That is to say, the future of were not active issues uh, in once we Britain went to war. Edward VIII was out as king already, and India, uh, the viceroy, had declared war on Germany on behalf of the people of India, whether they liked it or didn't like it. So uh, those things which had kept Churchill apart were no longer as important. So someone asked earlier about whether Stalin was a better strategist than we might imagine. It sounds like from your point of view, Churchill was not a very savvy military strategist. Is that sort of your argument? I mean, he kept saying, you've got to go through the Mediterranean, you've got to come up from the south. Was he not very aware of the military obstacles to the plan he kept promoting? I don't think so. Uh, he had his political ideas, his con basic notions, and these always, it seems to me, took precedence over immediate practical problems. There was one other which I think affected him very much, and that was the experience of the British on the Western Front in the First World War, so horrendous that that was something he about. And that, I think, affected very much his thinking during the Second World War. In this regard, I would suggest, come back when we talk about Roosevelt, is the exact opposite of Roosevelt's view. He is vice president and because he'd been on the Western Front. So I have a question that um, that's come in online. It says Churchill is often called the savior of Western civilization. Had he not been prime minister, what would have been the result? Would the UK have dropped out of the war? How would the United States have invaded Nazi-held Europe without UK as a launching base? In other words, do you accept the argument that Churchill was the savior of Western civilization during the Second World War? Well, he certainly played a major role but the Brits were not going to give in, period. And if somebody else had been prime minister, they would have stayed in. And it is worth noting that until his illness and death, Chamberlain was in the Churchill cabinet. And when there were those in Britain, there were a few in the government and in the parliament were urging Britain to make an agreement with Germany and Church, uh, Hitler was agreeable, was thinking that way because he wanted the German military effort the sooner the better to head the other direction, that is to the, against the Soviet Union. Chamberlain plays a significant role in insisting with those who wanted to make peace with Germany we're going to stay in this until we beat them. We're not going to give in. So uh, uh, in this regard, uh, Churchill and Chamberlain were of the same opinion. But most importantly, that opinion reflected the public opinion of the British people. 
And that had the backing of the overwhelming yeah. majority uh, of the people at the time who yeah. walked around carrying uh, gas masks, who went into whatever air raid shelters they could, and who put up with the rationing mm -hmm. and uh, simply took it for granted. And the bombing, both of London and of other cities, only made people in Britain more determined to fight. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, from the point of view of most of them, let's bomb Germany, <laughs> which, of course, is what they proceeded to do, and on an ever-increasing scale. I think one has to see it in that context. So, in a way, what, what you're suggesting are the limits to the so-called great man theory of history, which that question kind of suggests. The greatest leader is only as great as the population that he or she can lead, right? So, it's really, the British people who were the saviors, if we're going to use that term, who kept the war going against Hitler, yeah. not, not just Churchill. I, I remember, maybe when you all were young, you know, this image of Churchill, I remember my father had a record. When I was just a little boy, like eight or nine years old, we would sit in the living room and listen to the speeches of Winston Churchill. I know it sounds like an odd childhood. Other kids went out. And I loved the, I memorized the speeches and I went to school in my history class and I said, we shall fight them on the beaches. We shall fight them in the cities, but we shall never surrender. And my teacher said, where'd you learn that? And I said, at home, we listened to the speeches of Winston Churchill. And here I am today, I just can't get enough of this stuff. One other great quote, he says, after the fall of France, I encountered the defense minister of France. And he said, beware, the Germans will wring your neck like the neck of a chicken. Some chicken, some neck. I've never forgotten that quote. I quote it. Isn't that an amazing quote? And I remember that from listening. This is how historical education should work. My parents making me listen to the speeches of Winston Churchill I finally got out a little more often, but it was a slow start. Gerhard, thank you so much. We're going to take a lunch break. Um, these, are <laughs> these are bookmarks, not lunch tickets. But if you have lunch, you can find your ticket and go next door. Beth is opening the door. I think it's a buffet, right, that's set out. So help yourself, and we will reconvene. Uh, I want to say this to the people online as well. We'll be reconvening at 1.45 for the final session, Roosevelt and the American War. Thank you, Gerhard. Thank you very much.